I've got something special for you today. This is a question from the 2017 Putnam exam. The Putnam, if you don't know, is an exam for undergraduate students studying mathematics. It's basically a math contest. It has 12 total problems that you can get 10 points each for, so the maximum score is 120. Again, mathematics undergraduate students specifically prepare for this. You have to opt in to take it. It's not like just everybody in the country takes it. And in a typical year, half the students who take the test get a two or below. Two out of 120. So it's a hard test. But what I want to do today is actually look at one of the easiest problems I've ever seen on the Putnam. It's a personal favorite of mine. And part of what makes it so easy is it really rewards computation. That is not typically the pattern on the Putnam. Normally, computation, the ability to actually compute or calculate or perform derivatives or integrals or whatever, is not a super important part of the competition. Of course, you have to be able to do that stuff when you're trying to prove whatever it is the questions are asking you to prove, but the question is about the proof, not the calculations. With this specific exception, so again, this is problem A1, so that's the very first problem. The problems are split up into two sets, A1 through 6 and B1 through 6. You have, I think, three hours for each set of problems. And as we're going to see, this problem essentially rewards our ability to do some quick calculations and kind of understand why those calculations are working the way they're working. But that's enough prologue. Let's get into it. A1, let S be the smallest set of positive integers such that, and we have these three qualities that we're supposed to obey, 2 is in set S, n is in S whenever n squared is in S, and n plus 5 squared is in S whenever n is in S. The question asks us which positive integers are not in S, and then it clarifies one thing. What it means when it says set S is the smallest possible set is that S is contained in any other set that would obey these particular rules. So let's do a little legwork before we get to the calculation part. Let's specifically look at these two rules here. n is in S whenever n squared is in S, and then n plus 5 squared is in S whenever n is in S. We'll actually ignore the 2 for now because 2 is not a perfect square, so this first rule wouldn't really apply to 2 itself. But let's just imagine there is some perfect square in the set like 36. So let's just say S contains 36. 36 is the square of 6, and so that must mean that 6 itself is in the set. So n squared in that case would be the 36, and n would be 6. But then we know that if n is in the set, or whenever n is in the set, n plus 5 squared is also in the set. So 11 squared equals 121 would have to be in the set. From there, though, you can tell, well, wait, 121 obviously is a perfect square because it's coming from 11 squared, so that must mean that our set also contains 11. So we go from 36 to 6 to 121 to 11, and we're off to the races. 11 plus 5 is 16. 16 squared is 256, so 256 is also in the set. But again, 256 is coming from 11 plus 5 squared. It's coming from a perfect square, and so 16 would have to be in the set. Once we start with any given perfect square, you can tell we get a lot of numbers following that and specifically there's already a pattern about how those numbers are organized that's jumping out at us. So just as something to keep in mind let's jot this pattern down generally. Beginning from some perfect square that guarantees that its square root is in the set which then guarantees that that same number plus 5 squared is in the set, which then is going to start us back here at some perfect square being in the set. Specifically, we could say, okay, this means n plus 5 is in the set. And again, if some number is in the set, then the number 5 larger than that squared is also in the set. So n plus 10 squared would then be in the set. And so on, and so on, and so on. But I'm just going to keep this first part to keep in mind. We'll deal with the whole plus 5 plus 10 thing in a second. One other thing I want to think about before we actually start interacting with the whole two is in this set thing. They've asked us for the smallest possible set, but just so we have a sense of what's going on, what would be the largest possible set? They said S was a set of only positive integers, so let's consider maximally the set of all positive integers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten and so on. Don't worry, I'm not going to actually count through all the positive integers. It's certainly true that the set of all positive integers obeys these particular rules, because the set of all positive integers contains all positive perfect squares, which would then go back itself to 
all the positive integer square roots of those perfect squares. But for S to be the smallest such set, there must be some of these positive integers that don't have to belong to the set. It's our job to figure out which ones those are. Let's get into this by finally taking a look at what they began with. Two is definitely a part of this set. Now, two is not a perfect square, so it doesn't activate the n squared leading to n rule, but of course two is some n, and so two plus five squared, that is seven squared equals 49 must be in this set. Again, if 49 is in the set, then its square root seven is also in the set. If seven is in the set, then seven plus five squared, that is 12 squared equals 144 is in the set. And again, if 144 is in the set, then 12 is in the set. And so this leads us to our first insight. If we have some n in the set, then every number that is five, 10, 15, 20, greater than that number, will also be in the set. In other words, we can symbolize that two plus five K, where K is simply some integer. Two plus any multiple of five will also be in this set. So for example, we know that seven has to be in the set, 12, 17, 22, on and on forever. If we go back to that 49 for a second, we also know that 49 plus five squared is going to be in the set. So 54 squared will be in the set, which means 54 is in the set. And so in precisely the same way, any number we've once confirmed is in the set, will also be joined by all the multiples of five greater than that number. So if 49 is in the set, 54 is in the set, 59 is in the set, and 64 is in the set. And now this is getting interesting. Beginning from two and going up by multiples of five, we will never just randomly collide with a perfect square because in the decimal number system, no perfect squares ever end with the digits two or seven, it's impossible. But lots of perfect squares end with the digits nine and four. 64, in fact, is such an example, and 64 being in the set means that its square root eight also has to be in the set. And so now we can say for sure eight and all the numbers 5, 10, 15, 20, greater than eight also have to be in the set. If we want, we can jot that down, eight plus five K, again, K being some integer. And so now we start to think about, well, what are some other collisions, right? Where else would we run into some perfect squares that we could eventually take the square root of and get back nine or six or five or four or whatever it might be? Let's target one in particular and see if we could find a way to confirm that it is in this set. Let's think about four. One way to get four into this set would be if 16 were in the set. Well, we don't have anything small enough now that we can just add five to it to get 16, so it doesn't look like we can get 16 that way. But 16 would be in the set if its square, 256, were in the set, and 256 would be in the set if its square, 65,536, were in the set. In other words, what we're gonna target now are some numbers that end in six. Because if we can get some number smaller than 65,536 that ends in six, eventually we'll get 65,536, and then we can work our way all the way backwards to four. Fortunately, we can get such a number pretty easily because one of the numbers we've already worked with ended in six. We didn't compute it earlier, but 54 squared happens to be the same thing as 2,916. So eventually, somewhere down the line from 2,916, we will get to 65,536, and that means we get 256, and that means we get 16, and that means we get Four. Once we have four, of course, we also get all the numbers five, 10, 15 greater than four, which means we also have nine. And if we have nine, I need to go the other direction here, I'm running out of room. If we have nine, we also have three. If we have three, we have eight, though you'll notice we actually already had eight. There's one other number we can get pretty easily here, and that is six. Six, of course, is the square root of 36, and so if we can get 36, we can get six. You can tell since we already have 16, we can go 21, 26, 31, 36, and that's what gets us six. And so we can see at minimum, this set has to contain two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, and all the numbers that are 5, 10, 15, on and on forever, larger than those numbers. But now that leaves us with kind of a puzzle. What about 5, 10, 15, 20? That is, what about the multiples of 5 themselves? 
Can we get those numbers into this set? Can we confirm those numbers have to be into this set? And you can see here, we end up with a problem. If we wanted five, for example, we might say, well, is 25 gonna be in the set? That's the square of five, right? So if 25 were in the set, for sure five would be in the set. But 25 already ends in five. In other words, we're not going to randomly collide into something that ends in five unless we have some number that already ends in five or zero, and then we can add five, add five, add five to that over and over again. Going larger here doesn't help us because again, when I take that 25 and square it, I get another number that ends in five, 625. And if we don't already have some number that ends in zero or five, we're never going to get to some number that ends in zero or five. So we're never going to collide with the square of five or the square of 10, the way that we, for example, collided with the square of eight. Similarly, things that end in one, when you square them, always end in one. And although we would collide with some numbers that end in one, for example, 36 would eventually get you to 81, the square root of which is nine, one is special in that its square root doesn't just end in one, its square root is one. So we can't use the strategy of hoping to collide with some larger perfect square somewhere down the line and then working our way all the way backwards. So at this point, I think we can go ahead and answer the question. S is going to have to be the set of numbers two, three, four, and then all the numbers, some multiple of five greater than two, three, and four. That is, it's going to contain all the positive integers except for one, 5, 10, 15, etc. 1 and then 5 and all the multiples of 5 greater than 5. Being that that was the question, what is not contained in S, we are done. The smallest such set that obeys these rules beginning from 2 has to contain every positive integer other than 1 and then 5 and all the multiples of 5 greater than 5. 10, 15, 20, on and on forever. So that is how I would approach the easiest problem on the hardest test. One extension of this problem, if you're interested in it, is I actually took a much longer path, a much more circuitous path than was necessary to get to things like six, nine, and three. Comment down below, can you find the much, much faster path to get to nine, three, and eventually six? I will give you one hint if you need. It has to do with the fact that 54 squared is 2,916, and that 54 squared is actually exactly 200 away from another perfect square. But I fear I've already given away too much, so I'm not gonna say more than that. This problem has a special place in my heart. This was one of the first problems I ever actually solved with a student. We were working on it together. My strategy always being to go straight for the computation rarely works out on the Putnam, but it did in this case. And so I love this problem. If you also love this problem or love videos like this, like the video. If you want to see more problems like this, comment down below. I'll try to tackle a Putnam problem. Subscribe to the channel and otherwise I'll see y'all next time.